Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 254254254. How you doing, my friends? Como estas, eh? Bien? Great. Amazing. How am I? Pretty, pretty good. I gotta be honest. I've had a good productive morning. Loads of stuff out of the way. Loads of nice errands. All that stuff out, out of the out of the way, pushed out of the way, early in the morning, gym, all that sort of malarkey, after work, guess what it's going to be after work, a long five mile run, I went on a little five mile run yesterday, I felt the strongest I've ever felt in a while, I didn't run it to my full capacity, I did about an average about eight minutes, 20 each mile, and then for the last mile, guess what, I finished it in 7.59, my quickest mile I've done so far, I think in the whole time I've been running, so finally the endurance and the speed is coming back. Um, I'm able to kind of sustain the same amount of pace. I don't really, de- usually when I used to run before, especially in the, in the beginning stages, when I was trying to get rid of all this excess baggage and pounds on me, um, I tended to kind of have little dips, right? I tended to like go really fast for like about 400 meters, then kind of recover and waddle along and then go really fast again and then recover and waddle along. But now I can kind of maintain an even pace, um, a steady pace, sorry. So I guess that's a consequence of actually, you know, putting in the effort, making sure my diet is in place, making sure I'm losing the adequate amount of weight, making sure I'm also running a lot more. I'm just running. I'm just getting out there as much as I can during the week and just trying to run as often as I can. And then obviously supplementing it with some strength training, some body weight training, just to make sure I've got the the kind of, um, what do you say, the, the skeletal structure, the muscle density in order to kind of maintain and to kind of support my body as I'm running down the street. But so far, so good. So good that I'm actually considering buying a pair of running shoes now. I need to get a new pair of um, hockey, was it? How do you call it? Hockey Oni Oni, right? Hoka Oni Oni, however you pronounce it. Um, the nice, really cushioned uh, running shoes. I'll get something really thick in terms of the sole, just so I have something that I can really pound and abuse during the week. And then obviously when I'm going for a race or going to run a race, I'll then have something a little bit more minimalist with a bit more of a zero drop sole, something akin to what I used to wear previously from the uh, Nike undercover Gaiokusu, whatever collection they had previously back in the day. But something really quite minimal for racing and then a really fix off for training will be the adequate way to go about things. But I'm happy, man. I'm happy. Five miles last or last night. Um, it's a bit weird running in, the, running in the dark sometimes, especially, you know, considering how dark i am and considering how i don't have anything fluorescent i refuse to wear all that sort of silly fluorescent running stuff it really annoys me how all the running gear is either um fluorescent yellow for boys and then you've got the pink stuff for girls and it? it's just really um you know boring and simplistic i want something a little bit more interesting maybe some pops of yellow some reds some oranges and purples but it's all the kind of the same sort of thing and i hate that safety yellow thing the only thing i have that's similar to it or close to it is I've got like a little Carhartt neon yellow beanie that I wear sometimes if it's too late at night and I want some people to like not, and I want the drivers out there not to run me over, I'll tend to wear that, but I try to avoid wearing anything super fluorescent. So I tend to have only dark clothes on. So the way that I kind of combat it is obviously have the fluorescent hat on and obviously some white socks, but that's not enough in it. So I'll probably need to get maybe a jacket that's 3M, uh, maybe a 3M strap that I can put across my body or something, just something so I can reflect and then make sure no one's running me over. But then the other thing that is a problem when you're running at night is the pavements and the, the, the concrete slabs on the floor, especially in the area that I live in, in East London, in Stratford, and the kind of Forest Gate area, Canning Town, Plaster, West Ham, that whole area, the, the pavements are really poorly done, or most places in London, right? I think for the most part, they're always having to redig them because I think in the UK, is it in the UK? Is it London, I think, wait. I think in the UK, we have all our plumbing and stuff i'm pretty sure that's what they say that's why they said new york um roads are so tarmac so well right is that why because they put how they do it yeah i think in new york they put all their plumbing and stuff in the roads under the roads and they tarmac them over whereas in the uk we tend to put all our plumbings on the actual pavements and i guess the idea behind that is that you can lift up a concrete slab and dig a bit easier than you could do digging into tar but i don't know why new york has for the most part you can skate on a new york street and not, you know, you can, you can skate on a skateboard on a new extreme with really small wheels and not have any, um, and not be worried that you're going to, you know, um, absolutely buckle and flip over the, the skateboard when you hit a pebble. Because most, most of the roads in America are really smooth and tarmac really well. There was obviously potholes still, but they're usually all tarmac, whereas in the UK, our roads are full of cobbles. And then on the pavements, you've got 
for the most part you've got concrete slabs and any slab that's kind of you know a little bit disjointed or isn't laid down properly or the foundation has risen up maybe due to water and you know rain and stuff it tends to kind of flip up and obviously when you're running especially at night time and you're you know you're listening to an audio book or you're just daydreaming or maybe you're just in a zone i've many a times i've kind of stubbed my big toe on a on a on a concrete slab and usually i don't fall over but usually my whole impact the whole my whole weight kind of forces itself into that big toe and I end up you know having this excruciating throbbing pain there's nothing worse than that actually i'm actually fortunate i haven't fractured or broken my toes or anything because i've stacked a lot of times and usually it's because you know it might be because of my lack of awareness of where i'm running but also it's partly due to because you know it's dark isn't it and these whole these streets where i live there's hardly any lighting or lampposts and stuff it's really dark um i'm not sure why that is i think most of the reason it might be partly due to the local drug dealers and stuff purposely um purposely kind of um sabotaging and you know um cutting the cables of the lampposts around the area so that they can sell their you know their wares along the street and shit it could be that or it could be just the fact that this area isn't well maintained um they don't really look after the roads that well apart from the the usually the the bin men are quite good they usually come around and get rid of all the you know all the trash pretty quickly but for the most part you have to be kind of um you have to have your eyes out and make sure you're aware of where you're running but then again that can be really difficult especially at night it's not the easiest i did consider buying one of those little lamps <laughs> and put them in my hat but you know that's a bit much especially you know it's usually something you'd wear when you're running a western states to 100 or 200 or something right uh running in the middle of a forest somewhere that makes more sense but running in the middle of an urbanized city like london especially in Stratford and wearing one of those lamps you look a little bit too try hard you look like you know you look like definitely you know one of those full kit people so i wouldn't want to do that but yeah that's the major updates in terms of fitness so feeling really good endurance wise feeling really strong gym wise and yeah here we are man here we are another day keep on going and for you weak people that are looking forward to your um, friday it's only tuesday now you have to kind of suck that's the problem with having those expectations about days and wanting to oh i can't wait until it's thursday or friday when it gets to tuesday what do you guys do like you must be so gutted when it's to tuesday because it's not nowhere near thursday it's nowhere near friday You've got another whole day to go through on this Tuesday. Then you've got another whole day of Wednesday to go through. That's why you need to just like, you know, be at ease. Understand that. I think the week works out similar to your life in general. I think the idea that you start, you go back to work on a Monday or you start again afresh on a Monday. You start anew on a Monday and you have another chance to kind of rewrite the wrongs of the past weekend or do some other things. It's basically life, isn't it? It's basically the idea of like, you know, um, working in the fields, toiling for your keep. And then taking that money and doing the things that you actually want to do outside of work. But there's this idea of like you have to earn the right to enjoy yourself by working via being a valuable member of the team, a valuable member of your community. So this idea that somehow um, the rest of the days of the week don't matter, Monday to Wednesday, and it's always about Thursday and Friday is a little bit weird. And again, it kind of it, it kind of lends itself to people becoming depressed, isn't it? Because what? Imagine if you're working in a place where it's super slow and very reactive. And you're spending most of your time reacting to things. Imagine when you don't have to, we don't have to react to anything. There's no, uh, I don't know, maybe a customer service role is a good example, right? There's no, um, there's no one complaining about anything. You got to go for a period where it's quite quiet in the office. What do you do then? Do you know what I mean, you just need to be calm, cool, and collected, and you know, just keep it going, man. The week's a week. You're gonna eventually get to that first day. Just take it easy. Take it easy, my friends. But anyway, enough about that. Let's move on to the topics. I've got some issue. I've got some stuff that I've saved from the week, as per usual, that I kind of speak about on here on the podcast. So if it's your first time around here, strap in, grab yourself a beverage like I have here, a nice glass of little water, and sit back and enjoy all the little things I've seen on the internet that I think you guys may enjoy. Um, of course, if you're this your first time here, you know, um, and you like what I'm doing, smash that like uh, button down below, a little thumbs up. Let me know how you're feeling. Leave me a comment, and if you want to you know tune back in and see some other stuff that i'm posting why not subscribe if you're listening via the podcast app a five-star review will go a long way to help people find the show write a little review let me know if you've got any questions and of course you can always free to contact me visit my website agostinozinga.com that's agostinozinga.com link in the bio or link in the description if you're listening via the podcast app um link in the description too if you're watching via youtube click on that link go to my website click contact and send me a message and i'm more than happy to get back to you but yeah Let's get into some topics. So, first thing, I've been finishing, I've nearly finished Gomorrah, this book by um, Roberto Saviano. 
this book right here, right? You guys familiar with Gomorra? It's a really cool book. So this book is essentially um, an expose into the Italian mafia, something that a lot of people weren't really aware of, uh, especially the Nepalese, the Naples, yeah, Nepalese on the Politan, the Politan based mafia. Yeah. So essentially, um, Roberto Saviano, an investigative journalist or writer, basically infiltrated um, this underground world, was able to write this amazing thorough book on them, which then span out to a TV series. It's out now on Sky Atlantic, maybe one of the best um, mob TV series of all time, maybe ever. All in Italian, all in um, local Neapolitan slang, very dark, um, um, very complex stories, loads of interesting um, storylines going out throughout the whole series, something that I, that I really do encourage you guys to check out. Um, and the book's amazing, right? The book's even better than the TV series. Of course, it's the original source material. But having read this book, it got me thinking about this issue that's happening nowadays with these um, new woke films, right? Have you heard of this whole common adage on social media now about go work, go broke? This idea behind it is that a lot of these production companies are very much... Um, are trying to steer the films in the direction of um, ideology in the terms of wokeness, in the terms of, you know, identity politics. So they're aligning themselves with feminism, LGBTQ, LGBTQ stuff, trans, um, anything that's happening in society. Now, any article that you maybe see on BuzzFeed, um, you know, bemoaning the state of comedy or whatever it may be, or chick complaining about Chick Fil A, all that sort of stuff, right? They're trying to get all those messages, all those themes, and all those motifs, and implant them into movies. And the issue is that sometimes, as you guys are aware, I'm not the biggest movie buff in the world, but I do know that the moment you try to um, impose a message, a takeaway, an ideology into a theme, into a movie, sorry, is the moment the movie goes. Whoosh, because essentially the reason why movies are what they are is about great storytelling, right? It's about being able to tell a story cinematically in a way that connects with a lot of people. And if it happens to have an underlying message, so be it. But the fundamental requirement of making a good movie is it needs to be a good movie. Forget the message, forget the political overtones, forget the diversity of the cast and all that, whatever. Try and make a good movie and then fill in the blanks. I think this is maybe a reaction to this, you know, you remember when... um. Scarlett Hansen was cast as a like I forgot what movie that was, but Scarlett Hansen was basically cast in a movie that should have that's originally based on an anime, and obviously everyone in anime is Japanese, and she was cast in this role for this movie. It made no sense at the time. The movie kind of bombed and went out, you know, in and out of cinema. And I think because Hollywood has been so crap with how they represent people on the big screen, you know, you don't really see. It's not you know. I, I think a lot of I wouldn't say even marginalized. I say a lot of people who aren't your quintessential your kind of, you know, bog standard Hollywood looking person, attractive, whatever, maybe very fit. They probably don't see themselves reflected in cinema. Now, that's another question as to should you be reflected in cinema? Should you be reflected in art? Is Can art just stand alone as what it, exactly what it is? If you want a reflection of life, you just have to go out in the streets and look around. You see everyone, you know, whatever you can see someone that looks like you or it has the same background as you. But there is this idea sometimes that cinema doesn't take enough chances they rely too heavily on you know everything trying to become a blockbuster not every movie is meant to be a blockbuster not every movie is meant to be you know grossing one billion dollars at the box office that joker has right and that's a bit of an anomaly some movies should be able to just exercise the creative side of it and also serve as a platform to kind of give other actors a chance to kind of blow up and become the next big thing because production companies are very wary to give new actors or new actresses a role but they are quite cool in an idea that as soon as you can prove you can perform on the big screen and you can also, you know, sell hard tickets and get bums on seats. They're just going to use you again. They just want, they just don't want to take the risk first. So what would be cool if that, like that movie that Scarlett Johansson was in, that she um, got cast as like a Japanese woman, it would be cool to just get someone else in. Cause it's a movie that no one really cares about for the most part it is specifically geared towards a sci-fi audience. I think it's a sci-fi or anime or fancy audience. So it's a very small niche audience. But they're the loudest advocates of the movie, right, of the franchise, because they're fans of it. So if you actually cast the right person for it, maybe get someone that's unknown, give them a platform to grow, it's only going to get bigger from there, right? You look, you look at the, um, you look at Moonlight, for instance. The actors in Moonlight essentially were given a platform, not very well known. Some of the actors in The Wire is a good example. A lot of the kids in The Wire were kids that are basically on the street. A lot of guys that hadn't acted before. But they were given a platform and then they were able to kind of use that platform to then get other things, right? But production companies were never going to give them the first job. They only needed one person to do it first. 
So that's probably why we now have films like Scarlet, I mean, sorry, um, Charlie's Angels coming out and maybe the Ghostbusters with the girls in it, where it's mostly political. It's mostly an exercise in identity politics as opposed to a good movie. You have this idea you, a diverse cast is going to be the ticket to making sure people get bums and seats. But the, the reality of the situation is, much like the Louis C.K. stuff, with you know most of his tour is now sold out, especially his world tour that he's going on, the reality is that most people don't really care about what people are complaining or arguing about on social media. For us that are plugged in onto the internet and are cultural commentators, it must be you know the thing that's at the front of your mind. But for the common, average day folk, they don't really care. It might impact them further down the line. Don't get me wrong, we're maybe fighting a good fight here. But for them, they just want to see a good movie, right? Um, cinema already is, an, is a lot of money as it is. Um, you know, If you're going on a date with somebody, let alone if you're going to take a family, it's going to be insane. But if you're going on a date or you're taking out a friend or you're meeting up a group of friends, you know, you could easily spend 50 quid going to watch a movie in a cinema, especially if it's something that you actually want, enjoy, and you want to, you know, partake in the snacks, and you're not going to sneak snack in, snacks in, sorry. You're going to buy a drink, buy a burger, maybe get some uh, chocolates, whatever it may be. You're easily, easily um, approaching 30 to 50 pounds um, before a movie's even started. So people are more aware and conscious of that. And then also there's too much competition, right? Netflix and all this sort of stuff, and all these other streaming platforms are out. Disney Plus is now debuting. Hulu is doing real good things. Amazon Prime is slowly but surely finding its feet. You can't rely on identity politics to get bums and seats. There has to be a good movie. There has to be a, a reason for you to go there. Like movies work in the same way that Breaking Bad did, right? I didn't watch Breaking Bad for the longest period of time, but throughout the whole time I didn't watch Breaking Bad, I, I don't think a month where by I don't think a month went by where somebody didn't tell me you have to watch Breaking Bad. Like you get into conversation about a TV series that you watch and you're like, oh, what do you watch? And they talk to you and and then they tell you, oh, have you watched Breaking Bad? Like, no. And they keep advocating for it. And that's essentially what movies are, right? So the more you able to create a good movie, the more the actual word spreads. But again, too much identity politics involved. But then it got me thinking, why can't some of these directors who are firmly in identity politics field, right? Similar to this lady here who directed the charlie's angels i think um french um, movie that just came out recently where is it can i find it yeah here it is so there's this lady it's an article from buzzfeed right i'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this so this lady elizabeth banks directed charlie's angels and it's a bit of, it's been a bit of a box office flop right and she's kind of wearing it on her you know she's kind of you know being cool about it and saying that she's proud of her work it didn't go down as it needed to be but maybe she probably sees it as like you know she's the first person over the hill making a very um overtly feminist um you know um laden film and maybe it didn't work out but hopefully over time once society catches up you know it could work out which is you know a bit of a loaded um explanation of things but you know you have to do what you have to do so this article from buzzfeed it says the following um in case you missed it the new charlie's angels premiered this weekend unfortunately it's not doing so well at the box office earning just 8.6 million in north america in its first three days um but elizabeth bank who wrote that produced and directed and acted in a reboot had some choice words about the movie's box office failure on twitter um well if you're going to she says here in the tweet she says well if you're going to flop uh Let's get rid of this make sure don't go another page so yeah if you're not going it so says yeah well if you're going to flop make sure your name is on it at least uh times four right i'm proud of charlie's angels and happy it's in the world which is you know which is what you want really as an artist or as a creative for the most part you're not really concentrating on the numbers you never should be really numbers uh focused you should be concentrating more on the art but unfortunately because she wasn't concentrating on the numbers another thing took its place and it was the ideology right the this need to have a cast of badass women who are kind of you know occupying different aspects of the in of the intersectional intersectional lines or whatever me right uh pivots or points whether they may be on the chart and again it just takes away from it being a good movie charlie's angel there's loads of real room for it to be a good movie especially nowadays especially with the need for different kinds of representation but it doesn't need to be so heavy on the politics and the identity politics because it just it just um puts people off it's as simple as that really um not because people are not um willing to listen to your message or they're not woke or culturally aware or or you know or plugged into the internet or activism and stuff it's not because of that it just turns people off it just puts them off it's simple as that really and again the last thing you want in the movie is to be reminded about how shitty the world is you kind of want a bit of escapism i would say and some entertainment as well if you could sprinkle it in there it continues in an interview with um Harold son elizabeth bank wrote frankly about the movie's box office challenges and why she hopes people will get to go to see it look 
people have to buy tickets to this movie too. This movie has to make money. If this movie doesn't make money, it reinforces the stereotype in Hollywood that men don't go to see women do action movies, which is obviously an absolutely asinine and ridiculous statement to make. You know, you look at what Gal Gadot did with um, Wonder Woman and you look at, um, was it Wonder Woman, right? Is it Gal Gadot, Wonder Woman? Is she Wonder Woman? Yeah, I think it's Wonder Woman, right? Uh, Wonder Woman and then Captain Marvel of course was a little bit less of a good movie but still two pretty decent female led movies and I think even the movie recently Anna I think it didn't do that well in the box office but that looked really cool I like the trailer of that I think I downloaded it actually I still haven't watched it yet but that looks really awesome there's a lot of kind of female led movies that are out there that are really cool but again number one is is there's an assumption out there that you need to have a female lead that's quick, like a kind of a copycat of Arnold Schwarzenegger kicking ass right you don't really need to have that. I get the need for it to show women that are strong, but that's not really necessary. Um, and even if it is necessary, just do it in a cool and entertaining way and we'll go watch it. I've watched Angel Has Fallen, all the Fallen series, right? Um, I don't know. There's loads of them in that kind of... And they're fucking, it's, I think it's signed on for like five more or something, right? Insane amount of... Uh, uh, in that franchise. I watched Mission Impossible, James Bond, um, even uh, John Wick, right? These movies are not... Um, anchored in reality there's nothing real about one guy being able to take out a whole army of men no, nothing, nothing nothing happens like that in real life so this idea that guys won't go to see women in leading roles in action movies because it's not re- believable isn't true you just need to be a good movie it's a good movie like kill bill it will work simple as that and this idea that the reason why people are not watching it or men are not watching it is because they don't want to see other women succeed on the big screen is really really dumb and also it then goes to go reinforce why people wouldn't want to watch the movie because you come across just weird, isn't it? Like you're trying, you're already judging me because I don't want to watch the movie because it just looks terrible from the trailer. Not because it's got three women that are kicking ass on it, because the three women that are leading Child's Angels are all, are all awesome. Right? I'm a big fan of Kirsten. Um, what's her name? The girl that recently came out and said something about her being self partnered. I quite like her. She's really cool. She's really quir- quirky. She's obviously got a bit of her own personality. She's not a very boring Hollywood type. And she's just a bit, I don't know, she's a bit counterculture. I quite like how she is as a person and how she carries herself. Obviously, she's an amazing actress. So why wouldn't I go see these people on the big screen? It needs to be a good movie, though. So anyway, um, this is this keeps rambling on. It's a common history, common story. Does this go over again? You guys know the movie hasn't gone well. But I'm reading Gomorra. And in Gomorra, there's this amazing, there's several amazing um, female heroines or female capos, uh, leaders of clans who have been profiled in this book. And they do it, and again, maybe it's an Italian thing, maybe it's a European thing, but um, this, um, you get the idea that the women that are involved in the mafia use their femininity as a positive, as, as, a, as an asset. They use the fact that they could allure, they could seduce, they could convince, they could coerce, sometimes manipulate people to their advantage. Like, it wasn't as if, like, these women in this book, Gomorra, went out and started shooting people point blank in the head. They were able to kind of amass their power and their influence and control in other ways, right? In the in the ways that maybe would suit their temperament or their personality more. And it was done in a very clever and interesting way. Um, there's a couple of stories here that are really cool that I think would work amazing on the big screen, right? There's this uh, lady in here called Anna Mazza, who, right, number one, who is flipping awesome. Um, I think she actually was murdered. I'm pretty sure a couple of them aren't alive anymore. But there's interesting stories about these female capos um, leading the mafia, especially or the clans, especially when their husbands or their partners who are leading the clans go into prison or are arrested or are you know indicted for something or on the run. They didn't take control of it, and uh, the difference in how they manage and how they operate them is just amazing to see. So this is amazing woman here, right? Anna Mazza, I got them on. I got I got it on screen here. Who was one of the capos? And then there's another one called Papita, uh, Popeta Maseka, right? Who unfortunately passed away. But just look at this bio, right? Um, Aswanta Maseka, better known as Popeta, is a former beauty queen who became a well-known figure in the Camorra, which is the Italian gangs, right? She made the international newspapers headlines in the mid 1950s when she killed the murderer of her husband in revenge. So imagine how amazing of a story that is. You've got somebody who represents the absolute pinnacle of like your your kind of, you know, general everyday idea of, of womanhood or femininity in terms of being a beauty queen, but also has this sharp, rough, dark edge that's able to kind of um, take control of all these savages in these terms of men and also has this vindictive, um, vengeful, 
a part of her that's able to enact enact revenge on her husband's killer decades after the murder happened. It's an insane, it's an insane, great quality story, right? And these are the things that you would think would be work amazing on a big screen. Like how many actresses could you get that look similar to this lady, uh, Pupeta Maseka? So many, right? Dark haired brunette, uh, really pretty looking. It would look amazing on the big screen. These are stories that you'd love to see uh, profiled more often on the big screen, but instead, they're more worried about making sure the women are able to do jujitsu and take guys down with guns and, and stuff. And I don't know, do all this nut, nutty stuff and it'd be a, 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 an entirely um, a, a cast full of women, only geared towards women, and then somehow that's going to be a big box office hit. It's not how it works. I went and watched Girl Strip, not because it was. Um, I went and watched Girl Strip because it was a good movie. And I'm pretty sure Ghost Trip did well in the box office because, yes, it's more steered towards a certain segment of women out there or women in general. But it's also just a quality, um, you know, uh, buddy buddy movie that involves a whole cast of women, right? Going out there and, you know, having a trip together. It's, I think the one is that that's one about when the, the girl's about to get married right? and they go on a hen do. It's amazing because you know they're going to fall out. You know they're going to make up. You know it's going to be a story about them realizing what friendship is. And it's done in a very clever and interesting way, not heavy handed. And un the underlying line that ties it all together, it's a good movie. So I'd love to see that profile more often. And again, I don't know if it's something that some of these premium directors don't really want to touch or they don't really know about, but I'd love to see them pull some of these stories out, even from like ancient um, history or folklore. You can find loads of really cool, interesting uh, feminine figures that you can kind of um, take apart and basically frame a story around them, even kind of take them into modern history or take them back into time. I think it work really well. So yeah, I would love to see that happen more often. Again, pretty bummed about Charlie's Angels. And again, you know, for, for Hollywood, if you flop a couple of times, your movie doesn't do well in the box office, you don't get other chances because, you know, the backers, the money men don't really want to, you know, waste their money in that respect. So I, I feel bad for Elizabeth Banks in that respect. But I think next time around, if she's able to develop and produce her own film independently, it might make more sense to kind of go into the, arc, the, the, the history books or the library and pull out some really um, cool... Um, stories that would kind of further the women's movement without being too heavy-handed and without turning into some pastis or parody of itself in terms of like batwoman or something right you don't want that so maybe that happens going forward but you never know fingers crossed and hopefully it works out but yeah um, i like all the attitude behind saying you know wearing the loss on the sleeve i don't like this idea that if if men don't watch it it means that we're, we're, we're kind of reinforcing this idea that men don't go watch movies with movement in it. it doesn't make any sense if it's a good movie i'll watch it if it's a bad movie i won't watch it simple as i don't care who's in it and i think even um I think some of the movies that like Kevin Hart and The Rock does is a good example about it, right? They're usually quite terrible movies, but they have a great cast of people in it. If 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 it was just about the people, they would those movies would make millions and millions of dollars all the way time, all the way around, but they don't. Will Smith movies are the same way. He's very successful, very popular. But if the movie isn't good, people won't go and watch it. Simple. So it needs to be a good movie. But you know, what do I know? So move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Du, 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 du. What else we have here? talked about that oh ja Rule's not guilty you found about that ja Rule is innocent innocent of all these crimes and if you're wondering what crime is he innocent of being a doofus really yeah being a bit of a doofus um if you're familiar with the whole fire festival controversy that happened a couple of years ago i'm pretty sure right or was it last year anyway happened a couple of years ago um loads of stuff has been written about it you know it was a complete catastrophe it, t it, t it started being i think it went from being a fest it went from being like a retreat from influences and turned into some sort of festival thing with influences and public figures flying to this uh, island um and then obviously guests would then fly in they'll buy these amazing condos and tents and stuff and that didn't work out great catering didn't work out it was a bit of a calamity and everyone lost out on it the local community the people that went there were stranded and influencers were stifled out of cash you know loads of people were were stifled out of it and in the end the main um, architect architect behind the whole issue billy mcfarland was convicted and charged and now he's sitting in prison but i'm pretty sure he's secured a the rights to his book or he's writing his memoir now at the moment so you know things are still looking up for him because i'm sure when he comes out he'll get inundated with offers to appear on celebrity big brother do loads of guest appearances and all that sort of stuff he's able to reform himself and if he's a serial entrepreneur which it does look like he is he'll be fine but one person that was also came into a lot of stick who didn't actually get punished as much as they thought we thought he would do especially considering he was painted in the documentary was ja Rule. Now, Ja Rule wasn't, from what I saw looking at, from what I remember watching the documentaries, the, the Hulu and the Netflix one, it didn't seem as if he was complicit in the fraud. 
but he did seem gleefully unaware or gleefully misinformed and he didn't really seem that curious about understanding where exactly the money was coming from how they were going to fulfill their promises um and just in generally just being part of the overall thing he just wanted to be the front you know have his top off drink loads of beers and just kind of you know all the models around and just kind of be the the fun guy around there, the kind of celebrity stamp that kind of pushed the thing forward and obviously that didn't work out but it kind of seemed as if like for, throughout the whole process he was such a doofus throughout he was so unaware and he was such a he was so he was so eager to make sure this worked so he could maybe use it as a springboard to kind of um, launch the second phase of his career maybe he's kind of seen himself not much as a recording artist anymore and he kind of wants to move into other lanes which is more than which is more than you know um open to doing so i think the desperation to kind of paint himself as an entrepreneur to kind of position himself as an entrepreneur as a business person led him to kind of act really 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 dorky on camera like he came across really cringy i think billy mcfarlane obviously did as well but i think we're more familiar with seeing a billy mcfarlane figure if you've ever watched, worked in a startup or you've watched Silicon Valley, you'll know the Billy McFarlane's exist all over the place. So it's not much of a surprise that way. But the way Ja Rule acted and how he was conducting himself was really, really painful to watch. But it seemed as if the court has judged that he wasn't guilty and he's got nothing to... I think the, the case hanging over his head at the moment was the issue maybe with some of the catering or some of the money people lost out on. They were true trying to... Basically, I think no one's been paid back or owed the monies that they've got from the whole debacle. But somehow the court has completely um, ruled that that ja Rule has nothing to... No blame associated with his name whatsoever. So he's completely in the clear. And I think off the back of that, he's also going to launch his new app, something called Icon, which is basically the same sort of thing about, you know, connecting with influencers. But this article from Metro that basically speaks in a bit more. Let's quickly read through it. The title says, Ja Rule off officially cleared of wrongdoing in the 100 million fire festival lawsuit. Here, there's Jaro there with Billy McFarland. Um, Jaro has been cleared of wrongdoing in a major fire festival lawsuit two and a half years after the ill-fated festival. The 43-year-old 43, the 43 rapper has officially been dismissed from a $100 million civil lawsuit filed over the infamous festival, which was discovered to be a scam as artists cancelled and revelers' luxury accommodation never materialised. Attendees represented by attorney Mark Gagaros filed a class action suit against fire festival Billy McFarland, who's currently in jail, and other executives with co-founder Jaro also named the also the always on time rapper was dropped from the legal action in july 2019 with lawyers attempted to re-add jarrell's name jeffrey bruce atkins to the class last last to the class law action suit amid allegation he had advanced knowledge the festival was going to be a disaster so that's where i think i agree i think if you watch the documentary again documentaries are hard to kind of um ascertain any kind of truth i think we've seen it with the michael jackson documentary it's hard to kind of believe anything in there because essentially it is a filmmaking process there are they are trying to uh, propagate or push forward the narrative you know everyone's got their reasons for making them they're not necessarily uh, a platform for laying down the facts and let leaving the, the viewer to make their own mind up the best documentaries really try to make your mind up for you on a topic look at all the vegan documentaries out there that have meteors you know flipping out usually it's because they're trying to push a particular message they're not necessarily just trying to lay down the framework of saying this is why this diet is uh better for these people it's about this is why this diet is better than that diet that diet is nothing you should go here those guys don't know what they're talking about and it turns into a war and no one really listens to each other so the whole jaru thing if you look at the documentary you can definitely tell he was gleefully unaware he was um painfully uninformed he didn't he doesn't strike me as the brightest guy in the world. That's no insult to him. And I'm sure he does, wouldn't see it as an insult. He probably, when you have the level of celebrity he is, um, it's probably be better use of your time and resources to employ really smart people around you to advise you on the right thing to do. And then, of course, you being the artist, you being the public figure, you can then have the ability to maybe do a bit of a gut check, maybe, you know, lend your, you know, lean on your experience in the industry to kind of then add some more weight to your decision making process but you don't need to be the you don't need to be the de facto go-to person and have all the knowledge you know why, why would you do that especially nowadays when you can get people to help you out but if you watch it he just was not i know he was just unaware and didn't see the writing was on the wall he believed anything Billy McFarlane was spitting out there which is partly why Billy McFarlane was able to raise so much money for the festival in the first place because he was a convincing charming um charismatic um you know passionate dude so you could understand why you know if billy McFarlane could convince a room full of hard-nosed veteran investors to 
you know, um, sign a check and give him some money. I don't think Ja Rule was that difficult of a mark. You know, it was pretty easy to do. So I, I don't blame the court to kind of looking at it and thinking, you know what, this guy might be a bit dumb, he might be a bit unaware, but he definitely wasn't, didn't have advanced knowledge, right? <laughs> of it. Oh, yeah, this is a legendary dude here. Um, Andy King, you guys are familiar with him, you know, he's a ride or die guy. But anyway, it continues. Uh, however, Judge P. Kevin Castle um, has said, uh, the Judge P. Kevin Castle has sided with Ja Rule and dropped him from the civil lawsuit. Judge Castle said the court rejected plaintiff's con con consolary assertion um, that they railed on the defendant's uh, representation about the fire festival as insufficient to state a claim for fraud. In the case of Atkins, plaintiffs alleged that an actionable false statement but failed to allege that they acted in reliance thereof. J ja Rule's lawyer, Ryan Haywood Hayden Smith, um, why, have, why has everyone got three names here? Told All Hip Hop, this ruling is nothing short of total vindication for Atkins. Ja Rule had teamed up with Billy McFarlane on Fire Festival to promote Fire Festival booking app with celebs including Bella Hadid and Kendall Jenner promoting the festival. Are they still tied to a civil lawsuit then? Because I'm pretty sure they, they associated Ja Rule, sorry, Kendall and Kylie, I mean Kylie and uh, Bella. Are they still involved? I wonder what's happening there. Um, the, 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 however, all the, all the acts pulled out. People who arrived in the Bahamas were greeted by disaster relief tents to stay in, and the cuisine promised turned out to be cheese sandwiches in styrofoam containers. While Jaro is in a clear, McFarland is serving six years in prison for multiple counts of fraud, including the failed 2017 festival. The entire fire festival disaster is detailed in two documentaries. We know that, we know that, we know that. So yeah, um, he's pointing out another, another app too called Icon. I'm pretty sure he told them another, um, there's a famous picture of the container with food. Which is interesting, right? I guess if you've been fully vindicated and you want to make another move in the startup industry, you'll do it. But there is, um, and usually the startup industry is quite, we are, they're quite favorable to people who are able to execute an idea, it fail and then come back again. All your favorite founders out there have many, have a whole bevy of startups they started before the one that took off. So um, maybe that could be his fight. His fight could be, you know, his early app that he did that didn't work out. But I don't know the way he got painted in, in this, the way he got painted in the documentary, the way people reacted to him on social media, the damage might be irrevocable, especially if Jaro is going to be the kind of um, front person for most of these apps, which I'm pretty sure he will be. If he does launch another app similar to the one he did for Fire, I'm pretty sure he's doing one, right? Let me just quickly check it. I'm pretty sure Jaro is doing like another app similar to Fire. I think it's called Icon or something. Jaro Icon. I'm pretty sure he's doing something like that. Is it Icon? Yeah, see, he is doing another one. So here's Jaro talking about Forbes, right? With his doc let's quickly watch see what it's say here. Here's Jaro at Forbes talking about his new app called Icon. I haven't watched this, I don't know what it's gonna talk about, but let's see what he has to say for himself. I think the thing that drives me nuts right now, the main thing that drives me nuts, is people thinking or, or, or feeling like I would ever be a part of a, like conning somebody or, or, or fraud. Like those words are really, really like, fuck y'all. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, I would, I just wish everyone could know me personally. Like, you know, so then they would know like, Ja, that's not Ja, he can never do that. You know what I'm saying? He would just, that's not his character. But you know, that's just not the case. And you know, I get it all day, people, you know, you call my wife with the fraud stuff. Yeah, you, you got a fraud couple. You got a, <laughs> you know, I laugh about it, but it really is like, it really, it really is one of those words like, like rapist or, you know, those bad things that people put, like, I, that's one of those things I don't ever want to be attached this to. This is a problem that he has, Jaro. He doesn't seem remorseful, I guess because he generally hasn't done anything wrong. He generally got pulled, he generally got scammed. It's essentially like, imagine if you were working for Bernie Madoff. And he kind of um, enlisted you to be one of his sales reps for his Ponzi scheme that, you know, frauded billions of dollars out of, you know, people's pensions and, you know, effectively ruined people's lives, drove a couple of his, I think one of his sons to uh, suicide and broke up his family. Just, you know, he left a trail of bodies and broken families all over the place, right? So if you're one of the sales guys or you're one of the brokers that worked at, you know, Bernie Madoff's um, investment company, whatever it was that he was doing, and then Bernie Madoff goes down and you and the and the victims file a class civil action lawsuit against Bernie Madoff and everybody that works in the company, you would be 
a little bit angry and annoyed if everyone tried to come after you to pay the money back as if like you had any kind of insight into it because you know the fraud was occurring up above it's like when now would we work right that we work office is supposedly going to we work is supposedly going to let go of half the employee base across the world right because their founder the adam newman dude completely ran the company to the ground took out loads of loans against the company um way overestimated its value to the market um so much so that the ipo was thought was i think it's on pause now they were meant to go for a big ipo but they didn't um, decide against it and now he effectively got fired and then got given a bunch of money to get fired even though he didn't run the company well right so usually the founders of companies either get away with scot-free or they serve some time in prison right that's two of the same paths but for the people that are employed for the people that are using the service um or are relying on them as a source of income they're the ones that have to pick up the pieces so i get it but i think in the the way it was presented and the way he positioned himself next to billy mcfarlane as the kind of de facto go-to guy if it would have been a success he would have been front and center saying how important he was for the success and now that it's a failure he's properly trying to distance himself from it he wants there's nothing to do with it when he was the person that was having his top off drinking a beer in the middle of the beach ordering around um uh, models and trying to look like he was important and he had decision making um uh privileges and now that it's gone tits up he doesn't want anything to do with it and i think the fact that he made no again i don't know the details maybe he has it in the background but it looks like he made no real effort to try and correct the wrongs of this issue he didn't reach out to that um chef that was um highlighted in the netflix documentary the caribbean lady who essentially took out a loan or used her savings to buy all the stock and hire people because she thought the fire festival was going to blow then it didn't happen and she still had to pay everyone out because she promised them the money right he didn't make any effort to try and correct that and try and fix that issue he's you know he's got money he's obviously no count people's pockets we don't know if he's got money or not but he should have been a he should have made a public effort to try and correct his wrongs just own up to it and say hey i played a part in it but i also want to let you guys know that i was also frauded and, and and you know i was also frauded and kind of hoodwinked into this billy mcfarlane and kind of and you know um convinced me otherwise sorry billy mcfarlane basically duped me too but i'm going to try and correct this and make things right for the people that i can anyone else he directs them to the law directs them to the courts cool but he made no effort to do that he really was acting a little bit like above it like how he is now like laughing that he's his wife gets called the fraud gets called a fraudster too that seems really terrible right the wife had nothing to do with this and now suddenly he's you know everything that he does now every every post he puts on social media it will have people saying he fraud the people in his comments like his public perception and his public stock and value has decreased and that's the main reason why he would want to start an app that's the main reason why investment companies want to back him because they want to leverage his fame so if his fame is being completely tarnished on social and again people have their their people have their stances that they occupy and it seems as if ja Rule's not really looked at in the most you know in the best of light so i don't really know why he'd be putting himself front and center of logic another app people don't want to hear from you they, they still think that you're involved in this even if the courts don't so again i don't know i don't know let's hear what you say and now i'm attached to it influencer marketing for, for me is like the gift and the curse because it can be a great thing it can be used as a great tool influences you know they really can get the word out there to millions and millions of people and and build the excitement around your project too but it can also create a, a sense of i give you an example like of a, of a great a, a movie everybody comes home and like yo the movie's so good you gotta see it it's the best movie and then your expectations for the movie are so high that it's like no right how do i actually meet this under sell over deliver you know let people feel like oh it's gonna be okay and then get there and be like wow it was out of this world versus it's gonna be out of this world and then they're like it was okay <laughs> yeah but you can't really I say that because fire fish. festival didn't even get to be operational it wasn't even it didn't it's not that it didn't meet the standards they completely hoodwinked and you know they completely sold they sold something that didn't exist they didn't have a festival, right? You watch a documentary and you saw that they were planning a festival, I don't know, a month or two months out. They didn't have any plumbing. They hadn't sorted out all the tents. The, uh, the, the, the catering was non-existent. They had to move islands because of uh, Billy, Billy McFarland's um, um, insistence to, to kind of uh, put the fact that the island was formerly owned by Pablo Escobar and the copy over it maybe. 
or El Chapo, whatever it was, and the the the, the person that, la- that owned it said, you know, explicitly told him not to use that name in the copy, and they did it, and they got chucked off the island. Like they 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 essentially messed it up for themselves. They they didn't deliver the product at all. It was not like some festivals we have in London where you know we're over inundated with festivals in London. There's too many in the U- in the UK by and large. We're the kind of kings of festivals and the rest of Europe, right? There's so many festivals out there that there's not enough t- there's not enough lifetimes you can live to go to all the festivals in the world, right? Not not gonna happen, especially in Europe. But some of them are not successful because of poor execution, um, maybe poor infrastructure. Uh, they didn't staff the festival too well. Usually, you know, the bar and the entries and all that sort of stuff really makes a festival go down the tanker. And sometimes the sound is a big deal. But, you know, you have to, you have to deliver it first and then I can make my mind up. They didn't even get to attend the festival. People got there and were given styrofoam containers with a bit of bread and cheese on it. That isn't a festival. That's you telling me to, that's you, that's, that's, that's essentially what the fraud case was about, isn't it? Like they were sold one thing and then when they got there, it wasn't what they were sold. So again, this guy is completely, completely deluded. If he, if he thinks that the reason why it didn't go successful, or even influence the marketing is bad because you over promote something. That's not the reason. It's because most of the stuff that influencers promote is a bit crappy, right? It reminds you of those things that you would have seen um, marketed or advertised on those kind of um, 24 hour sales program things like qbc right a lot of the influencer product pro- products are sort of like stuff you see on qbc right really crappy um chains and you know supplements and uh waist trainers and stuff that isn't that great that aren't that great um braless things you know the little suction cups that amber rose was, was was promoting they don't really work that well so they promote them and they're quite crappy right for the most part but if, a, if an influencer is able to promote something that's really of value that they can kind of get behind that that kind of aligns with their own uh lifestyle and what interests that they have it can completely blow up like look at look at look at some of the fashion brands out there right they're able to kind of tap into actual style or stylist or public figures or you know street style stars give them some products and it kind of works really well especially if it links up well with their kind of overall image the moment it doesn't it's the moment it flops I'm sure some of the Emma Chamberlain fans, when they saw Emma Chamberlain getting photographed or being flown out by Vogue and wearing Dior and Gucci, it didn't really make any sense, right? Because Emma Chamberlain is sort of like, you're this normcore, quirky white girl who's, I don't know, under the age of 21. And, you know, some, yes, she's a successful YouTuber now, but some of the girls that follow her aren't that, you know, don't have the 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 means to afford maybe buying a, a dress from Gucci or whatever it may be. So that way it doesn't make any sense. But to assume that, Fire Festival didn't work because you oversold it. It's ridiculous, man. You didn't even deliver anything. You can't oversell something you don't deliver on. Back to launch Icon after Fire. Because everyone was like, Ja, why don't you just wait till all the lawsuits are done? And, wait, and, and, and my answer to that was, okay, so these lawsuits could take two, three years, which they did. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, so I'm supposed to wait until those are over to yes. try to rebuild yes yes you mug like i don't know what's wrong with this guy look man the public sentiment about ja rule started going down the tanker when david Chappelle done that you know done that comedy skit or done that, that line about you know i don't care about what ja rule thinks right that's when his stock went down when people started to realize that when this guy wasn't rapping he actually had to speak outside of you know making good tunes and and you know crooning on the hook is when you saw that you know he was not the sharpest knife in the in the drawer. Cool, that's okay. No one wants you to be Elon Musk, right? That's fine. But in the world that he's existing, being an influencer, being a public figure, being somebody of notoriety, being a hip hop legend, he has to realize that the reason why startups are even giving him the time of day and opening their doors to him is because he has value in the market, right? He has stock, he has currency in being a celebrity, in being somebody people are familiar with right so that when this brand aligns itself with this guy they can use him to leverage his influence and celebrity to get the word out and get awareness and obviously hopefully drive the um acquisition user sign up sales whatever it may be but the moment that that stock that value dips right for instance like big brands aren't going to go and sign up a d list or z list a celebrity because they don't have the necessary currency they need to reach people that they want to reach they're going to go to the top So if your stock starts to fall, then it makes sense that you have to be very careful about how you conduct yourself in public because you don't want your perception or the idea of you to get further damaged by the things that you do or say. That's the life of a public of a celebrity or somebody in the public eye, right? You kind of have to not care about what people think 
And you also have to care about what people think because essentially they're the ones that are giving you the platform and providing you the means and the ability in order to kind of live that lifestyle. So th- this idea that you should maybe sit back and allow the documentary to film and not do- tweet nonsense and not put himself out and not kind of distance himself publicly from himself and let the courts go through the process because again the courts are going to be um are going to be completely subjective in this right they're going to look at the evidence analyze everything and come to a decision if they can come to a decision without caring who you are and and ascertain that you were not involved it's a win then you can come out and do the entire rollout go on oprah sit down with the guys at the or the girls at the view and really speak openly lay your heart out be very remorseful about what happened and understanding the pain people went through and say that behind the scenes that you helped this person out you did what you can do here and there but you don't have the funds to be able to support everybody you hope you can but you're hoping with this new platform that you're launching see q there that's when you launch your hope this new platform that you launch is going to give people the opportunity to see what i was trying to do and i hope that people are able to support it and see what they can because we're going to try and push another narrative of what influencers should be that's how the rollout could be but to somehow allow the courts to run their case now at the moment to as i say whether or not you are fraud or not to make sure whether or not you haven't scammed people out of their money and ruined their lives forever you're going to also promote your brand that is insane. That's what you show he's super delusional. He has no idea what he's talking about. And again, it goes to show, more likely than not, he's other this other thing will also flop. It's simple because if 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 it's relying solely on him being the person in front of the camera, um, is is if if it relies solely on him pushing it forward and being the person that's bringing the brand awareness to it, the moment people see him and see Icon, they're just gonna remember the Fire Festival. They're not gonna give it any sort of a chance. And that's the thing that he's really not understanding. He essentially ruined the entire rollout of this issue because now the main thing that's been thrown out, I only rep- remember the icon because I remember him talking about it in the Breakfast Club. Most people are only going to click the news of Jaro because they've heard he got acquitted of all charges from the Fire Festival. They're not going to give a Scooby Doo about the new icon thing. They're not going to care. Build and rebrand my company. I said it take. It's going to take me a year to build the platform. More than anyway. a year. My second thought process. More than a year to rebrand it and too. But you can't do it concurrently. Like it makes absolutely no sense. When when people are invest when when um Neil deGrasse Tyson was going through what he was going through in terms of you know his sexual assault case right or um you know unwanted sexual advances to that lady, um he was very forthright and said I'm going to you know allow the the process to go through a procedure and you know what he did he took a back seat now fair enough sometimes those big public celebrities especially the ones that are signed to William Morris and stuff those people are very those agents and those kind of you know um entertainment people are very aware and very um. They're very plugged into what's going on and they know how to conduct their clients. So they'll probably tell you to like, you know, stay off the TV, don't be on social and just kind of keep yourself quiet until the case is kind of run through, which allows people to kind of forget that you were involved in it. And also once the once the story comes out that you are acquitted of all charges, then you can start ramping up and going on appearances and talking. Same with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Remember he got acquitted or got found not guilty of all those charges? That's when you saw him on Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, going on Russell Brand because the charges dropped and he could then go and promote his book again. But to say that you can somehow promote your new app and also have this looming case behind you is nuts because what? Because in, even in investment terms, most um, VCs are going to be wary about investing in you whilst the case is running anyway they're going to say look i'm going to hold off and let let the case run its course and then once it does get back to me but even then your your name might have already been muddied so this guy i don't again this guy is insanely dumb really is i hate to say it but this is insane if it, if he's able to succeed in spite of this then kudos to him right i'll give him his all his dues but it doesn't look like he's giving himself any chance to win like honestly even this even this interview is is essentially mostly uh, propagated under the guise of him explaining or explaining his side about the whole fire festival thing. It's not really about anything else about Icon. One, me sitting home and watching someone else create and do this idea and watch it go. No one's created and, it. And I'm Cause it's a poison chalice. Sitting there like that was mine and my idea. I had it built, everything, and now someone else is getting rich off of my hard work. You know, and so I seen other companies start to sprout up, starting to try to, you know, steal the business model a little bit, and and so I, you know, I, I jumped right back on the horse, rebuilt, rebrand, and here we are with Icon. And for me, Icon is ten times the platform that I, if I would ever run it. You know? oh, anyway, he's he's deluded. I guess I, again, hopefully it succeeds for him. You know, it's cool to see another black man doing his thing. Blah 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 blah. That common trope. But for the most part, in truth, this guy has absolutely gave himself no chance to win. He's made a rod for his own back. 
um, especially in this area where everyone has an opinion, i.e. me, um, everyone wants to kind of see somebody at loss lose again, really in a bigger, major way. Some people are quite vengeful too. So the fact that he was acquitted of all charges concerning the fire festival, it might put a battery in some people's backs to make sure he gets charged for this other thing and he gets found guilty of some other thing or that they make sure that this fa this thing fails. So again, he's really messed up his chances of succeeding with his app. And, you know, it's just really asinine because it's such an easy thing to do, to correct. Wait until the court proceedings have, uh, have all finished. Don't make any noise or, or announcements. Keep yourself quiet. Stay under under the radar. Don't go in the breakfast club and start laughing and joking about the whole situation where people all around the world or somewhere um, in the Caribbean are suffering still and haven't got any money back for whatever they've gone through. It's just bad optics. And then suddenly sit down here with Forbes and kind of cry this woe is me. My wife is being accused of being a fraudster too because of this crazy story. It's not a crazy story. You are front and center of this documentary. You were there right next to Billy McFarlane wanting to be the de facto celebrity endorsement guy. The moment it went tits up, you kind of distanced yourself naturally. But now you also distanced yourself from the, from the responsibility of looking after the people that were wronged, of trying to correct the narrative, of trying to clear your name. Instead, he's it's just, he's bemused what anyone would think that he's a fraudster. We don't know you though. Why, why, why would we not assume that you could be a fraudster we don't know you personally it's an it's an insane it's an insane way to go about things but again it also is nothing short of what is to be expected in the startup world most startup founders are like this so you probably learned something from billy mcfarlane they're just crappy people um they don't really have good ethics or morals right maybe because the fact that it's quite un it's unregulated and essentially you can start up your own startup in you know underneath your duvet wearing your boxes um, you, you essentially can kind of write, rewrite and write, write and rewrite the culture of your company, you know, week in, week out, day in, day out. You can be involved in every kind of meeting. You can structure the company so that you have the de facto power and autonomy and decision making process. Um, it just kind of encourages really bad behavior. So I'm not surprised that he thinks that he's in a clean, he's done nothing wrong because, you know, in startups, no one does anything wrong. I'm sure Adam Newman, the, the we, we work dude, will come around and be like, hey, it wasn't my fault. You know, no one does anything wrong. No one owns up to their mistake. They all ride off to the sunset with their payouts and leave a whole trail of um, destroyed and dismantled lives because the other people weren't none the wiser what was going on at the top. But again, who knows? Maybe Master CD might not. But for me... I think he's absolutely um, messed himself up really in that regard. But, you know, what What do I know? What do I know? Anyway, next on the list. What do we have here? We have... Oh, Kylie Skin is sold for $600 million. You heard about that? That's quite cool news. I thought that was awesome to see. Happy for the girl. And happy in general, just um, the numbers are just... The numbers are what everyone should be happy about. I think it goes to show just how big and limitless the beauty industry is. I think now people are maybe taking it a bit more seriously, maybe off the back of the um, Jeffrey Star documentary with Shane Dawson, the fact that he was able to document the entire process of um, launching the collaboration um, with Shane Dawson, how to make money, um, how to position yourself, how to market. And they saw quite quickly how you can turn somebody that's an influencer on YouTube, align them with a product that makes sense with their audience, market it well, and it can sell out in minutes. And now people are saying that, okay, cool, this market is booming and very much willing and ready to buy more products off of more individuals right um who else has launched a makeup line i think billy that girl from stranger things has got one right um 11 she's got a, a, a kind of a skincare brand out there so essentially if as long as you're in that space and it's authentic and you give a crap you can start yourself start one too i'm really looking forward to seeing who's going to be the first male skincare beauty or the first straight male um, icon that can kind of take that to the masses because I think there are still a lot of men I don't know if it's a, a view or if it's a hesitation who probably won't buy a skincare brand that is essentially being pushed out by a openly gay dude I don't know why that is maybe it might maybe because they're afraid to make the makeup or the skincare routines might be a little bit too heavy it might be a bit too makeup y maybe the average dude wants something that looks doesn't, doesn't look too like it doesn't look too much on the skin so maybe the introduction of imagine I've always assumed that maybe someone like Cristiano Cristiano Ronaldo could probably be a good um, lightning rod to kind of get that movement started and kind of open the doors and hopefully everyone else would uh, run through the floodgates because he's essentially like you know a pretty uh, masculine alpha male who also really takes care of himself, works out a lot, eats clean, 
and you know is really into his i'm assuming into his um skincare fragrances haircuts all that sort of stuff so he could probably be a good lightning rod for it going forward but this kylie jenner skin or this kylie skin thing is really really awesome and really goes to show just how much money there is in this industry and how it also goes to show um her entrepreneurial business acumen is operating on a really high level because i really i remember saying to a few people it looked like from the it looked from the beginning of when the brand started. It may be because of the nature of the packaging, it being just like you know, uh, like a sort of like baby pink, soft pink colors, you know, zero branding. But it always seemed to me that she was doing this. The brand was always an exercise in not branding, but an exercise in business acumen. She wanted to show people that she could. She wanted to show the investors out there, or people who are who she wants to maybe align herself with, <coughs> that she can actually do this. So the best way to prove it is to put your own money up. Um, you know have a really uh streamlined team run the business completely off your laptop have all the other stuff that you don't need to do in-house outsourced sell it all to direct to consumer on your own website and then once you're able to show that the demand is there the interest is there you make the money you make the sales you can then go and sell it to another company and allow them to go do what they want with it similar to what happened with joe malone joe malone i think got ousted out of her company for the most part i think she got pushed out of it but you know the idea is that you can you can show the concept works. Maybe it's ideal not to do it with your name so you don't have the name. It's not kind of devalued and sold on, but, you know, it's only kind of skin. And then you can allow people to just take that and kind of, you know, people trust the brand and they can take that on. And then, of course, if you let people know, oh, yeah, she still has 49% um, um, interest in the brand. And over the years, that percentage will decrease, decrease. The most starts cashing out of her shares. But people will still have the idea that she's associated with the brand. So essentially, the brand can live on without Kylie quite easily. So this is a this is an article from Fashion Law that gives a bit more background into the whole deal. The title is, uh, Koti is taking a majority stake in Kylie Jenner's three-year-old beauty brand for $600 million. So imagine three years, three years since she's launched it, and it's already worth $600 million. Which again, goes to prove for all the haters out there that were not very keen on it, in the three years time that you've been hating on Kylie's skin, what have you done? No, no one's saying that you should go out there and build your own multinational uh, multi-billion dollar generating company but this is one of the key representation of sometimes hating is a waste of time because in a three years time that you could have been you're writing comments leaving hateful comments spreading propaganda and just waiting for her to flop and to cancel herself or waiting for her demise this brand has gone from being a zero to being worth 600 or not even worth she sold a stake of the company for 600 million so that means if she was able to sell what the whole company it'll be a billion dollars worth or something like that if you you know just let's do times two because they bought just over half that's insane for a three-year-old brand that's insane so again hating is a waste of time if you don't like it guess what you do you just ignore it and you invest in the brands that you do like promote the brands that you're interested in don't waste your time promoting like in a de facto way or in an underhand way something you don't like because it's only going to make people more interested that's essentially what happens but anyway it's a story for another day the article Koti is taking a majority stake in Kylie Cosmetics, a deal that values the star's buzzy beauty brand at $1.2 billion. The New York headquarters, headquarters beauty um, giant is set to pay $600 million for a controlling stake of the 22-year-old's three-year-old cosmetic startup, betting that the young celebrity's brand, which is expected to bring in $200 million in sales this year. So they're going to invest $600 million in it, which means, effectively, if they're smart and if they kind of, um, you know, are able to introduce uh, some other product lines, they can essentially get their money back within three years. Answer. Again, so much growth in this industry. You need to pay attention. Pay attention. Um, which better to bring this year. Um, so, can can revive Coty's struggling beauty business, which is based in CoverGirl and Max Factor, according to Wall Street Journal. This is where the growth of the market is, says Coty Finance Chief Executive Pierre-André Dorsey said on Monday, referring to the emergence of a burgeoning celebrity face social media-centric segment in the 500 billion uh global beauty sec sector uh with the built-in basis of consumers by their fans celebrities certainly have a well-established advantage over new brands in many cases even established ones which is in which is at least part of why the likes of lady gaga who launched her house labs this summer with the help of amazon and Rihanna, who teamed up LVMH to a Fenty brand, and others have success in the bringing beauty products to the market in recent years. In addition, the luxury of launching products to an already established and often highly engaged pool of consumers, celebrity founders have powerful marketing tools right in their pockets, free of charge, which is this, this smartphone right here. Um, charity endorsements through million dollar social media posts have the ability to reach consumers faster than any traditional marketing campaign, says Joseph Magnacaca or Manaka, 
CEO of cosmetic licensing giant Massage Envy and Dow celebrities are vying to leverage their status in order to cash in on the lucrative beauty and skincare market. So again, cool, amazing stuff, right? And then something that kind of rounds up this whole issue that I was really interested in was this amazing tweet by this tech investor called uh, Web. He's on social. Uh, you just find him at twitter.com forward slash web. But he wrote a really cool uh, tweet that I retweeted earlier on or last or yet last night that really kind of summarized it really cool in a really cool way, right? It says the following, uh, Kylie Jenner recap. Number one, use their own capital to launch Kylie Jenner skin. Two, hired six people. Remember when they did the whole office tours, you showed the office and the team, really streamlined company as most beauty brands are because essentially you can outsource loads of the manufacturing and packaging and stuff and shipping to other people. So you essentially need to kind of run the company. You can run the company essentially off your own laptop, especially if you're an influencer and you're teaming up with a brand. Number three, paid close to zero in ads. Of course, she has an advantage in that respect because it's Kylie Jenner. She has a very active, she has a very, you know, she's got some of the highest fo- no yeah she's got loads of followers on social media across you know most of them on twitter and instagram um so she's able to um talk to them directly but even if you didn't have the followers that kaya jenna had you could easily um you know uh, reach out to influencers who do have the active who do have that captive audience put the product in front of their audience and hopefully have that be a way for you to kind of uh get the money coming in that way number four leverage her media trends of course number five leverage supply partners of course number six built a 1.2 billion dollar brand uh seven now 600 million dollar richer and eight she did it in five years so from inception to delivery, five-year process. She's turned a brand, you know, invested her own capital into it. So again, she don't have any outside investment, which is kind of something that I think Gary Vee says often, leaving money on the table. I think that's how the premise comes from. This idea that you should start small, build your company with your own money, your own sweat and tears, actually be a practitioner, do the work, uh, don't just talk and hypothesize about it. Don't outsource it to an agency. Try to make it work with your own money, with your own capital. Don't take any cheap um, shortcuts to kind of get further ahead. Do the hard work and the grunt so that when it does come around to you maybe needing investment to take your brand to the next level or if you just want to cash out and do other things, your brand will be worth so much because you've shown that the concept works. You've shown that the you've shown the proof of concept. You've actually shipped your item. People want it. There's customers there paying for it and it can function on its own dime. So if a brand comes in and walks in and, and pays you off six hundred million dollars, they are they are safe in the hope and the assumption that they can make their money back because your money your brand's already making money without you doing that much. So imagine if they press the button on their huge big corporation machine, that brand's going to go boom, boom. It might not last forever, but what they want to do is make their money back, and of course they're going to make their money back. Come on, man. So yeah, I'm um, cool to see. Um, and they obviously ended the tweet by saying above isn't the result of fame alone, which I definitely agree with because the first retort you hear people saying, oh, but she's a Jenna, she really started rich. Yeah, but how many rich people do you know? You have to look at um, the rich kids of Instagram to see the amount of kids out there who don't do anything with their fame. They don't need to. Of course, I don't. I, no one's judging anybody, but there's plenty of rich kids out there who don't do anything with their fame. They don't leverage their fame to build businesses or to employ people or to just in general, you know, just be part of culture in that regard. They just enjoy their money, uh, enjoy their trust fun spend it and live life she's actually put herself in the firing line launched a brand that was not received that well when it launched right there were some really bad reviews of the skincare products online by loads of social media and influencer types right they didn't really like it at first so she took a lot of bullets took a lot of arrows rid the way was able to maybe you know go back to the drawing board correct some of the formula I'm not too sure if it's better now than it was before but again it didn't come for just it wasn't plain sailing it was a difficult process so you know uh, credit to her man credit to her credit to her and great to see and hopefully this is a trend that we get to see um going forward and i think you don't need to be as a, a big of a of a celebrity or a icon to kind of take lessons from this i think it can apply to most people like i said investing in yourself not taking an investment in the beginning making sure you can prove that your business is viable and people actually want your product or service and then you know going from there but yeah cool to see man cool to see i'm really um invigorated by that story as you can tell from my enthusiasm so um let's go through a couple of more and then end it what else can we talk about let's talk about some clothing stuff in it maybe a bit more fun that way Oh, do, 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 do. oh this is quite cool um at least i've got a little sock trainer out i think this is the move isn't it everyone's putting out socky type trainer shoes in the vein of the balenciaga sock race what is it called racer is it the racer balenciaga sock racer whatever that one's called everyone wears i'm not really a big fan of it personally and i think balenciaga i've got another sock type shoe out that was just debuted at the spring summer 20s show that i wasn't a big fan of either because you know i just don't like my feet being that close to the ground um i'm pretty flat-footed 
even though I have built my arch up quite over time for the process of um, loads of squatting and loads of running and using, you know, a lacrosse board to kind of get into all those little fibers in my feet, but they're still not where they need to be. So these shoes that are completely like essentially a plimsoll aren't necessarily the things that are going to work well for me. But I quite like Alex's uh, version of it. I think Matthew Williams is probably along my kind of same thinking. I think you can tell by what he wears. He does prefer a chunkier sole, something with a little bit more girth to it. So I think this edition of a shoe is probably something that's way up my alley. So I've got here on screen a new debut model from Elix. Um, of course, like I mentioned, headed by Matthew Williams, uh, formerly of uh, what, what, they, what were they called again? Um, Bin Trill Collective. <laughs> he also did a bit of creative directing or advising for Lady Gaga back in the day. And then essentially kind of spun off and did his own brand, Alix, which has gone from strength to strength over the last few years. They've, they've kind of launched loads of accessories. Loads of, actually, you know what? They actually did a good job of kind of blowing up off the back of that chest rig. You know, that might have been a really clever way to do stuff. Like they actually was able to kind of um, build a platform off that, you know, chest rig and then kind of grow an overall ready to wear brand from that. I'm not sure if that's the lineage, but again, really cool guy. Got his finger on a pulse. Um, really wholesome. The fact that he does it in, in you know, in, com um, in conjunction with his wife, a former model, her friends, loads of lovely, adorable kids, and just really done in a really clever, interesting way. Essentially, like um, a modern day version of like a kind of goth ninja luxe uh, street version of Helmet Lang, maybe, I think. I don't know. Or maybe some sprinkles of Margello in there, but I'm a real fan of Obelix aesthetic. I'm a big fan of the brand. I've got the actual um, belt on here, actually, that you can't actually see there. Can you see that belt? Right there? Yeah. Anyway, you probably can't see. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So they've got a new shoe here called the, um, and it's called the Sock Sneaker, right? No, it's not called the Sock Sneaker. They happy to saying it's called the Sock Sneaker Trend, but I like it. It's essentially the same kind of um, upper as a Balenciaga sock racer that you guys have seen. Essentially, it's a you know it's a new neoprene sock sort of thing, the same sort of thing that you'd maybe have under your tights, maybe a bit more padding with a bit more structure and form in it. But then in the Elix version, they have a really chunky, vibrant sole. It looks quite modular. I'm not sure if it is modular. I'm not sure if you can take off the back heel bit and put on different plates on there. I'm not too sure, but it does look really nice. I love the off-white color of the midsole. I love the tone and the color of the top of the sock of the sock itself it's all like a mild gray kind of similar to like an athletic sock you wear maybe you go to the gym and a really versatile shoe that would work really well with a pair of shorts work really well go some tailored trousers maybe some black leather pants some nice tactical pants it's just a very versatile piece of clothing that again will probably sit quite well along the whole entire um outfit line or look or line of what Alix kind of puts out there so let's read a bit of the copy even though hype pieces text is usually quite rubbish but let's read it anyway um it says here, hiking boots, camera wrap, Nikes, and derby shoes. These are just a few of the footwear silhouettes that Alix has dished out this season in order to suffice an array of aesthetic preferences and environments. Up next in line, in the lineup, is uh, one of the brand's most modern editions yet, which is the Alix has put its own spin on the sock inspired trend. The shoe is constructed of leather and nylon and features a heavy gray knitted upper. Okay, it's knitted upper, it's not even a neoprene. That's pretty cool. That helps to ensure the glove like fit. Keeping in line with the label's other footwear choices, the sneaker is equipped with vibrant sole that offers a thick and sturdy foundation. These are like an off-white leather overlays and black heel stabilizer add contrast to the shoe. So again, looks really nice and really impressive. The sock thing I'm a bit nervous about because of my toes. I've got really wide feet and really chunky African toes. So they, they usually kind of pop up at the front that's what i'm a bit nervous about um you know you get a little knuckle dust at the front whatever it may be but maybe the structure of the shoes maybe the fact that it's got this little uh lip at the front right this little foxing here might help in terms of making sure your toes don't pop up too much um again maybe the sole is sunken a little bit in there so your foot kind of lines up around there but i love them man i like the contrast things the the basically the fact that it's mild gray on top i think that works really well which means we probably will see an all black version very soon or maybe something with a black and white version at the top will look really nice as well so again i really like their kind of interpretation of it of course a vibrant sole they've, they've kind of used vibrant soles for all their shoes i think going going forward they're obviously custom made too in it right? i wonder why they use vibrant soles instead of tooling their own maybe it's because they can get better deals i don't know maybe production is better i wonder why because i'm sure the uppers are not i'm sure the tooling for the uppers are something they have to kind of make from scratch right so would it necessarily fit or maybe they use the soles that are already available from vibram and then they tweak them here and there i don't know but interesting i like it regardless i think it looks really cool really chunky uh really impressive silhouette 
that would work well with a lot of outfits. It's gonna it's already out um November thirteenth, price at nine hundred and thirty five dollars. Pretty sure it's available in Leaks web store. So definitely check it out if you're that way inclined. One of my favorite shoes that I've seen so far this season. Um next on the list, what else do we have here? Let's quickly go on. Maybe do one more. Uh Bape and Big Sean. Yeah. I'm not one to cover news that I don't like, but I just think this is a good example of stuff that I wish could be done better. Is that a good thing to say? Yes, that I wish you could done better. So, um, Bape is doing a capture collection with Sean, with Big Sean, right? And uh, Big Sean's got quite a, a long history with Bape. Maybe not so, maybe, maybe not in the authentic way that I would like, because I think Big Sean came about Bape just after Kid Cudi. It feels like he was a bit late on the train when it just started to die out. He started to wear it quite often. I think the Bape kind of explosion probably started and ended with the whole cohort of maybe Lil Wayne, Birdman, Clips, Teriyaki Boys, Kid Cudi. That's the kind of era that I remember hip hop being a real influence on Bape or Bape being a real influence hip hop and vice versa. After that, I think a lot of the people that came after the fact, such as Wale and Big Sean, they didn't necessarily have the same pizzazz or same kind of cool points. And that's where maybe my um, reservation behind this collaboration comes from. Um, I don't really look at Big Sean as a stylish guy. I don't look at him as an influencer or as a tastemaker in that regard. I think there's other uh, people in the hip-hop space who are a much better fit for something like this. And I also think, by and large, Bape has done so much damage to his reputation, then with damage to his legacy, that no matter who collaborates with them, it's just going to, you know, it's just going to be in the news one minute and just hop out of the news the next. No one really cares. Um, even Kid Cudi did a capture collection with Bape, right? And even he's, like, he's got an avid fan base, right? Um, loads of people that really love Kid Cudi, no matter what he does, no matter how good or bad his music is, they would love to associate anything. That they, they, they love to buy anything that involves Kid Cudi. And I don't think even his collection did, that did too well, from what I remember. I'm not too sure. But I can't imagine Big Sean would be that much better. He's obviously gone through his issues himself, I think. That's why he's been out of the public limelight. Hasn't really dropped anything recently, as a, apart from the odd feature here and there. But he's not necessarily the most hot ticket item, I would assume, on the festival lineup. Again, I don't know. From what I've seen of his live shows, he performs really well. Like, his production is amazing. I remember seeing him perform, what was what festival was that? Coachella, where he performed and he had um, a screen behind him where he had loads of doubles and multipliers and um, kind of, was it? Are they uh, projections? I don't know. What were they of him in the screen? It's like loads of kind of multiples of him on the screen that would look really cool, choreography-wise. But again, he's just not the style or influencer guy that you'd want to front a Babe collab or a Babe capsule collection. It doesn't make any sense. And, and again, the products that they kind of brought back are a bit naff as well. It just doesn't really hit home the way it did. Now, that's me talking from my point of view. I've been spoiled. I was around when Babe kind of first launched in London or in the UK. Um, I went to Biddy Workshop. I went to Hideout. I bought stuff from Yahoo JP. Um, I was buying, you know, camo snowball jackets and old school babe camo jackets and obsessing over the candy floss jacket. And, you know, I think the interest started to dip when they started bringing out the alien hoodie. Remember the alien hoodie? Or well, That's when it started to kind of go down. Still obsessing over the shark hoodie. Um, wanting to buy all the old school uh, babe varsity jackets and camo jackets and whatever it may be, right? Interested in the brand overall. Still got loads of kind of basic cut and sew pieces that no one will really know it's babe that I still wear it to this day. But I don't know if a kid nowadays would really, again, with all the brands out there, all timers, Stussy doing bits, uh, you know, uh, Kaha even doing some great stuff, Dime out there, Grind London, uh, Pleasures, uh, Stray Rats, uh, Brain Dead, like so many good brands out there. Would a kid really want to, and those brands usually don't have that much, you know, celebrity endorsements to kind of um, get them uh, in front of kids and get their attention. Usually they just rely on good product. It's even brands like Noah, right? They're not necessarily promoting any celebrities for their brand. So I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know if this is the best waste of time. It's good for, obviously, for Big Sean. It's a, it's a major um, opportunity for him. It's a good cash grab as well. It, again, it's a good positioning for him, but I just don't look at him as, he's not the style guy for me. I don't think he's stylish. I don't think he looks that great in clothes, personally, especially considering how small he is. You would expect him to be a bit more swaggy, but he's not really. Um, I just don't know. I don't care. He just doesn't look that great. Um, it's just a bit crappy, you know, like, He's got this camo shirt with the Bape logo on the front. Uh, what does it say? A bathing Don Life, like really so naff. A black t-shirt with his signature sunglasses on them. 
I think well, those gazelles, a trucker hat with the bathing ape done life at the back of the teacher. It's got um, closet looking like Planet of the Bathing Apes from one of his tracks. Cool, that looks super naff. A picture with the illustration of Big Sean. I'm guessing on the front of the shirt, a camo shirt, some babe. Even his pose with the babes it just doesn't look cool. Like nothing about it is just cool. Nothing about it is interesting. It's just so naff. Waste of time. And again, just goes to show just how dead Bape is at the moment. They're having to kind of pull uh, Big Sean out to kind of front a campaign, similar to the Lil Wayne stuff with the Uggs. It's just so horrible. Like, again, it's just so sad to see where Bape, is, where Bape once, was, once was. I've got a book here still that I always talk about when I'm always mentioning Bape. I can't actually find it to hand, but it's so sad to see where Bape once was and now look where it is. It's just a shame, isn't it, really? But not everything can last forever, but you just wish it was just more cool. Look at Supreme. They're still cool. In, maybe not to everybody, but they're still cool, right? Baby, just not cool at all. Like, Big Sean isn't cool. It's just no cool. I don't know. I'm not down with it. Um, it's out now, I think, is it? It was launching in the Bape store at Melrose Place in LA. Um, when is going to launch? The 16th. So it's already launched. For those of you that care, check it out. But not for me, man. Just a, just a shame, really, where Baby's gone. Big Good luck for Big Sean, of course. Positioning-wise, I'm sure we're probably going to see an album come out very soon if he's kind of put himself front and center that way and being a bit more active on social but in terms of a consumer in terms of a avid bape fan in terms of somebody that was obsessed with nigo and now nigo is gone it seems like the house the house has completely fallen down in it house of cards has come tumbling down but maybe it's just me maybe it's just me anyway that's an hour I've done a bit more today an hour and 20 so thanks so much for tuning in this is Jackson News English episode number 254 thanks for checking me out as per usual check out my website actionozinga.com for all info regarding myself that's agostinozinga.com you can find the link in the show description click whatever app you're using click the show description you'll find the notes of the you know what if i have any links on there i'll add them into there and you can also find the link to my website if you want to read a podcast app just click or oh, via youtube just click the description down below and you'll find it you'll find all my gig listings i'm playing in this i'm playing actually on december 21st next at the heath Cone star so check me out there um nothing else coming up that i'm aware of but apart from that until i see you guys very very soon take care be safe bye bye